Welcome back to the SaltWorks Podcast. I'm your host, Hallie Dye. We are so excited that you're here today for our second ever video, or if you're listening, just like always. Um, and we are super excited about our guest that we have on today. So welcome to the podcast, Miss Jan Lee. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Um, and just a disclaimer, Miss Jan is uh, losing her voice because of allergies. <laughs> so she's a trooper for pushing through today. So thank you. Well, before we get started and jump into your story, Miss Jan, who is Jan Lee? Well, I am a mom, mm -hmm. a grandma, a foster parent. Um, my husband is Randy. Um, I have four children. Mm -hmm. Two are in Monroe. I have one in Texas, one in Omaha, and grandchildren in Texas and Omaha as well. Mm -hmm. um, we you like to visit them as much as possible. Um, as much as possible, not as much as I'd want to, right? But as much as possible. Yeah. Um, in Monroe, we always have joked. Um, our youngest son Parker has lived here for years and uh, <laughs> yeah. whenever we walk around the church or even out in Monroe um, you know we meet people and they find out we're Parker's parents and <laughs> oh you're Parker's parents so anyway that's my claim to fame in that's Monroe. Right. That's hilarious <laughs> and Parker was on the episode um, on the podcast I think episode 41 or two I had it in my notes at some point so people need to go listen to that episode too um that's hilarious. Yeah. Well, I, I understand that. As a third born in my family, I understand <laughs> being Lindsay's sister or Jared's sister, you know. Uh -huh. um, well, Miss Jan, tell me about, we'll start in the early days of your story. Tell me about your childhood because I know in your notes you mentioned your family didn't attend church regularly. Right. Did you go on special holidays? What did that look like for you? Um, I don't even really remember going to church on holidays. Yeah. But I remember as a very young child being pulled, mm -hmm. you know, I felt that, that nudge. Yeah. Um, my parents, like I said, they didn't take us to church. Mm -hmm. Although, uh, very young, I would turn the television on back when it was just three channels, three, six, and seven <laughs> yeah. in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And there was a lady on there who had a, a story time. It was called Jean's Story Time. Mm -hmm. And she would tell Bible stories, but she would also relate them to everyday things yeah. that people would go through. And in order to get children to watch, she would tell what the next week's story would be, and then she would have a, a storyboard of pictures, and you could draw whatever she wanted you to draw. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing that. I would watch every Sunday, and you turned in, tuned in, mm -hmm. and I could see my picture on TV, which was really cool, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, I was hearing God's word and hearing, yeah. hearing stories. And um, was it that? Um, was it that show? that you would watch that would encourage you, that started to encourage you to find a church? Yes. So yes. How, how, many, how long did you, how many years did you watch it? I'm not even sure, probably yeah. a couple of years. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Miss Jean would invite mm -hmm. children to go to church, say you need to go to Sunday school. Yeah. And um, in our neighborhood in Omaha, I lived close to several churches. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually there was one that a little girl in fourth grade, she invited me to come to her church. Yeah. And so I did. I walked. My parents let me walk. It was several blocks, but I walked. And I remember getting there, and the little girl didn't come that Sunday. Aww. And so I just showed up by myself. And yeah. But there were Sunday school teachers there that just welcomed me in. And, uh, you know, I can remember that warm feeling of them loving on me and um, I think there were other children that came too without parents. I remember one Sunday there was uh, a little girl that showed up in high heels, wow. like her mom's high heels and yeah. she was clomping across the floor and I remember the teachers just kind of looking and kind of whispering but they just, you know, yeah. they loved all of us and it was, it was, it was great. I went there for I don't know, several months. Yeah, that little girl would be garnet. <laughs> <laughs> she is always in some accessories. Um, that I, I love that, because um, we'll see as we go throughout your story, 
you know, it would be a while yet until you would have that full surrender moment that you recognize at a certain point, but that you could look back, whether you knew that or not as a kid, that you felt that tug at that age. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was so cool reading your notes that here's Miss Jean. She doesn't know who's watching. She doesn't know if it's going to be effective, but here you are years later sharing her encouragement, you know, and how like that was planting a seed. I think so often like we can think when we're thinking of our own obedience or what we're doing, our service in the world for the kingdom, is this making an impact? And what we were really asking is this making immediate impact, Mm -hmm. but it could be 30, 40, however many years in the making and it's still useful you know right we just never know you never know and anyways that was beautiful to me um so you felt to encourage to go to church and you said you would go to two different ones was that because the girl invited you to one of them she invited me to one yeah. and then miss jean uh i believe went to a lutheran church okay and so i went to that one and <clears throat> my stepdad actually dropped me off at that one i told him i wanted to go so you know, they didn't go to church, but they didn't care if I did. So yeah. I'm glad, you know, I'm glad they did. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and even just the memories that you have of those teachers loving on you, you know, because you know how it is when mm-hmm. you're in there. It can be chaos, and you're like, did they get anything from the lesson? <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I mean, you have stories of my kids being like, hey, I need to tell you something. <laughs> nothing to do with the lesson, right. you know. Right, I have um, second grade boys. Yeah. <laughs> you are up to date on everything. Then. Um, that's so funny. But, but that, you know, you are making a difference, even if it's just the feeling that you give someone of a safe environment, mm-hmm. you know. And I loved that in your story. Um, okay, so in your notes... They fast forward to age 23. Mm-hmm. And at that point, Miss Jan, you had three kids. Is that right. correct? Uh-huh. About how old do you know? I'm mean, uh, all young. One, three, and five, yeah. I believe they were. Yeah. <clears throat> so can you tell us about that season and kind of what led up to that? And what sure. You found yourself? Um, I was married when I was 18. Mm-hmm. Um, had three children. Oh. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my ex-husband had extramarital affairs, mm-hmm. and uh, you know we tried, or I tried, working things out, tried to, you know, fix things. Yeah. Um, it was a horrible, horrible time in my life. Um, yeah. My parents also had just moved from Omaha, Nebraska, to Plano, Texas. Yeah. Um, took a job there, and so I didn't really have the support of my parents, mm-hmm. and so it was just very, very difficult and um, not a lot of money to get by and so um, you know I look back on that now and I've been in a lot of ladies Bible studies and you know we talk about God being a a jealous God and wondering how that feels and um, when someone is in adultery it felt like it ripped my guts out Mm -hmm. I mean it was horrible horrible yeah. and I think how how must God feel yeah. when we don't give him our full attention and we don't yeah. do what he wants us to do I mean we're the bride of Christ right. and so yeah yeah I've used that example a few times in mm-hmm. ladies bible studies that is but. very powerful <clears throat> it makes me think of um we've been studying kind of in our life group going through what we we're calling the big stories of the bible you know because mm-hmm. whether you grew up in church or not you don't remember them how they really were you know what I mean because right. the it's wonderful to go through children's story bibles but it's not all the details and mm-hmm. um I mean we knew it would be powerful but it's crazy how many things you see connecting to the gospel and um we studied um a few weeks ago Abraham and it's kind of like this is the way I kind of understood it this time going through scripture that he reveals parts of the promise and the covenant as he goes, you know, like Mm -hmm. as he's obedient and as they go through, I mean, God knows, but Abraham's learning bits and pieces at a time. But at some point he calls Abraham to make a blood oath. And it was, it's kind of a weird section. You're kind of like, 
what is this, you know? And I was going to kind of like skip over it until I listened to this other podcast on it. And they basically said anyone looking off from a distance would have known this was a blood oath. Like in their culture, they just knew this is what it was, you know. And so um, God called him to um, split these specific animals in half. And it's kind of gory. But the, the idea was both parties, usually, the way I understand it, both parties would walk through the trail of blood and say it was a... Um, a kingdom that was like, we'll take care of your people, you know, like they're more established, they're more secure, they've got the army, whatever, we'll take care of you, um, and they'll walk together if you give us your loyalty, you mm-hmm. know, and so they're going to walk through together, and the idea is that if you're loyal and you uphold your end of the bargain, and anyone comes against you, this is what will happen to them, you know, what you see around you, but if you don't uphold your end of the bargain, this is what will happen to you. But before Abraham can walk through it, um, he's caused to go into a deep sleep. I think it even says in darkness. So he's unable to walk through it. But then we see this image, and I can't remember exactly. I should have pulled this up, but I didn't, I didn't know we were going to talk about it. But, um, but this image of, um, I can't remember the exact things, but fire and smoke basically mm-hmm. mirroring how he's going to lead them out of Egypt. But we see those images walk through the blood trail and like it was so powerful because the idea was while you're sleeping, while you are unable to keep your end of the bargain, I will keep mine. Mm -hmm. And he basically put the death sentence on his son in that moment of he will keep his end of the, the bargain. And the whole idea was that like as a covenant, it's so much more than a promise because a covenant in that sense, God obligates himself. He puts his character on the line in a way that if I don't do this, then I'm not who I say I am, but he is. Mm -hmm. And it's just so powerful. And I don't know, it just made me think of that when you were talking about, not only is he a just God, but he's faithful when sometimes no one else is. Right. And it was just crazy to me. Thank you for sharing. Um, so what did it look like following you're a single mom? You said money is tight. You're you were working in a department store, correct? Yes. Yes. And, and I worked for cosmetic lines yeah. and I don't know how they are today, but back then it was a pretty good income. Yeah. Because we got commission on everything that we sold. Right. And so that was <clears throat> a blessing. Yeah. You know, I probably didn't think of it at the time, but it was a, a true blessing. Right. Um, that's actually where I met my husband, Randy. Um, he was a shoe department manager. Yeah. And so his his department was adjacent to the cosmetic department. And then we had a mutual friend who introduced us. Yeah. So That's so neat. Were you all friends for a while? Or did you know, like, okay, we're kind of dating? You know, um, like, was it clear? It was clear. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and so he, you know, came in, loved your kids. Mm-hmm. Um and then you mentioned around that time you were going to a church, but you didn't feel like it was really yes. displaying God's Word. <clears throat> right. You're standing on God's right. Word. How did that look? Um, I actually started going there in high school. Yeah. A teacher invited me. And I just remember the, the pastor would stand up in front of the church mm-hmm. before he preached his sermon. Mm-hmm. And there was a huge Bible. And I, <clears throat> it was on a turntable. But I call it a lazy Susan now because yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was this, in Louisiana. <laughs> well, but it was this big Bible, yeah. and he would read a scripture, and he would then spin it around, and he would say, "Here ends the reading of God's word." And when I look back on it now, that was the end of God's word for that mm. Sunday morning many times because it was more of a uh, social. Mm. social sermons, pep talk. Yeah. yeah, pep talk, sermon, yeah. social issues and things like that, and right. not a lot of meat mm-hmm. and, you know, from God's word. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, in this, I feel like we might pull back out in our story as we go, but I have, like, so much compassion reading your notes because you you said multiple times you weren't quite, like, you hadn't quite surrendered, you didn't quite have that personal relationship yet 
But I think like I'm putting myself in your shoes. You're a single mom of three kids trying to make ends meet. Your family has moved off. You're going to church. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you're you doing what you believe is the right thing to do, but it's not based on truth. Right. And you think, like, how many people are in that situation and don't mm-hmm. know they're not being fed? Right. Because they're showing up and they're eating, but it's not sustenance. Right. You know? Yeah. And that's... Scary. And I didn't realize it at the time. No. You know, I just yeah. thought, you go to church, that's the right thing to do. Right. So. Which is, I mean... It, that is true. Like, show up there, but man, like, it just, you know, puts into perspective, like, how important it is mm-hmm. to know his work, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah, that was a powerful part to me. Um, so, you met Randy, loved your kids. How long did you date? I think it was about a year and a half. Okay. And you said he, you found out his dad was a um, Baptist preacher yes but you felt like at that time randy had kind of strayed wasn't really necessarily living in his relationship he wasn't walking Mm -hmm. walking the way that he should yeah Um, and i think back on my in-laws um they probably were so um maybe upset i'm not sure but Mm -hmm. you know because when we got married we were unequally yoked and um did you I can't know, imagine. <laughs> did you know you weren't a Christian, or do you just look back thinking that now? I just look back thinking that now. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't didn't really know what a Christian was, I guess. I thought, well, yeah. I go to church, and I, you know, right. listen to the Bible. and Yeah. But I wasn't a true believer at that time. Mm. So, But his parents just welcomed me. Yeah with open arms and they loved my kids and it was just it's amazing you know when I think back on it now yes and were they there in town with y'all no okay no they were a couple hours away okay yeah but we got to visit them quite a bit yeah that's neat to have that family like reintroduced you know when yours was away Mm -hmm. um so Parker came along. Your claim to fame. Yes. Which I have written here as episode 41. I knew I did write that as something. Um, Parker came along. About how, how long was it until he came into the scene? Um, we'd been married two and a half years. Two and a half years. Right. Okay. And, and that, just, a funny, just a funny side note with yeah. Parker. We talked about this the other day. Um, you know, we had this, this family with I had the three kids, and then we had Parker. Mm-hmm. And... Um, we never said, you know, oh, these are your stepsisters, stepbrother, yeah. anything like that. And mm-hmm. he told me the story of one day he went <clears throat> down down in the basement in our house. And I still had my um, wedding album from my first marriage just on the shelf back in the corner. And I guess he went down there when he was around five and he got it out one day and opened it up. And here's mom in a wedding dress, and but this isn't my dad. <laughs> and he came upstairs, and and he said, "Who is this?" He's <laughs> calling you out. So then we got to, you know, we got to have that little talk. But yeah. I mean, you just don't don't think about saying right. things, you know. And, and we talked the other day, and he said. I guess I didn't wonder why they all called him Randy. Yeah. And I called him Dad, you know. <laughs> when I get older, I guess I call him Randy. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, well, and sometimes those things with kids are like, do I introduce this or do I let them lead right. when they're ready to lead? Right. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah. Um, so you were operating, when he was little, you were operating in daycare in your home? Is that what you yes. said? Yeah. Yes, so I could stay home with him. Yeah. So how did that look? Was that friends, kids? How did that come um, about? No, I actually advertised and yeah. had five, six, seven kids, plus my own sometimes, in a yeah. tiny little house. It was pretty crazy. I bet. <laughs> it's crazy with just my three. <laughs> I have a picture um, one time, I think Parker got chicken pox, mm. and, you know, I'd call the parents and say, hey, we have chicken pox, and they're like, well, they, they need to get them, I'll just bring them, so. <laughs> I hear those stories about 90s parents, so like, yes, we're going to go ahead and, and get it. <laughs> but I have, I, have a, I have a picture someplace of probably 
seven little kids on my couch lined up and they're they're holding their shirts up you know showing their calamine lotion on their chicken pox they all had them together <laughs> oh my word bonding experience that is so funny um so you talk about in that season you're running the daycare four kids now you and randy are married but you felt like there wasn't something quite right was that inside your marriage just in your heart it was like, it was both all the above. i mean i just I wasn't happy. Yeah. I was just felt depressed a lot. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, I had married this man. He loved my children, but we just didn't, didn't jive, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and so you talked about kind of, um, and you mentioned this earlier with your first marriage of like, you tried to fix things mm-hmm. and you know, that, that word, it can be a good word. But it can also be a word that means it, it's in our own strength. You know, we're trying right. to do this in our own strength, which we are all guilty of. Mm-hmm. Um, so what did that look like for you in that time? Were you trying to fix things, you know, yourself? Um, I tried to fix myself. I tried to fix him. Yeah. You know, we do yeah. that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that happens and, after sanctification, yeah. too, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't having it. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you started listening to um, a local Christian radio, is that right, station? Right. I think that was kind of my um, socialization because yeah. of having that daycare and all the kids. I needed adult input into my life. Yes, that's how I got into podcasts. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Same. So I would mm-hmm. listen. Um, I turned the radio on one day, and it was on a Christian radio station. Mm-hmm. And they were having a share Yeah. And they were asking people to send in money. And I couldn't imagine why in the world would people send money to a radio station. Mm-hmm. It just didn't, yeah. didn't make sense. Right. But I listened, and I kept listening more and more. And I, you know, even after the share was over, I listened to it. Mm-hmm. And um, back then it was more, um, there were radio preachers that would preach during the day. It wasn't just music. I right. think today it's more yeah. music during right. the day. It was preaching. Um, I listened to people like Warren Wiersbe, Mm -hmm. Chuck Swindoll, Mm -hmm. J. Vernon McGee, who I think may have been dead at the time I was listening to him. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, But anyway, just it was God's word. And there was a specific counseling call-in program where people like me, unhappy marriages, trouble with children, relationships... And these counselors would give these people advice as they called in. Yeah. But the advice always included God's word. Yeah. And that just struck me. And so I grabbed a, a pen, mm-hmm. my Bible, and started just, you know, soaking it in. I'd sit it during nap time when the kids were sleeping. Wow. And I would just write scriptures and look up scriptures and it was just yeah. it was just refreshing right. to to hear something different. Yeah. Well, there's a part, um, I kind of have this later in my notes, but I feel like it goes here, but like, there's a part of Parker's story that we talked about in his episode of when he was feeling the doubts and the feelings of having cancer, which we'll you know get to in your episode too, but, um, and he came to y'all and y'all just got out the Bible and said, what does God's word say? And y'all looked through and stood on certain truths from God's word. And I told him like, that was one of the most profound parts of your story to me. It's simple. I mean, it's what we should do, but Mm -hmm. how often do we actually do that in our times of need stand on that as if it really does have the power Mm -hmm. to sustain us. Um, We believe it on paper, but then do we do that? And like, that was so powerful to me, but reading your story and seeing how you, sought the Lord, but felt the absence of his word, whether it was perceived or not, you know, had the absence of his word in church. And then on a radio station during kids nap time, hearing God's word and how you were so hungry for it Mm -hmm. and how you recognize that as sustenance was so powerful. And I'm like, okay, that makes so much sense to me, Mm -hmm. you know, because I think sometimes when you have grown up with it, you can take it for granted, you know, right. And it's, it's real and it's powerful, Mm -hmm. you know, and your story just showcases that so well, I think. Um, 
So you're listening, you're starting to take notes. And then there was, um, was there like a salvation invitation on the radio one day? Yes. And I, I can't remember who gave it. Yeah. But like I a just, sermon or. <clears throat> yeah. And, um, I just surrendered at that point. I was by myself in my kitchen. I think I was drying dishes or something and yeah. just gave up. Yeah. And, um, it was like overwhelming sense of peace mm. when I did that. And, um, I actually remember too, after I did that, going down in my basement and just sitting for hours and crying and repenting and mm -hmm. just, you know, I knew, yeah, I knew that, you know, I needed Christ and he had me. Yeah. So, wow. That's amazing. I, I, I just love the image of you just doing dishes. It's just another day. It's you, mm -hmm. you're used to turning the radio on at this time. And then, your life changes forever in that moment. Right. Just the the beauty of Christ being able to reach us anywhere, right. anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that. Um, and so often, not that you didn't have people in your life that were believers, um, but so often we have people on that talk about, um, well, I had this neighbor that would take me to church, or I had, you know, and it's like that. Those things are so important. But yours was a TV show and a radio station. Right. Right. I mean, just so cool, uh -huh. you know, and so, so clearly the Lord. Um, so you have this overwhelming peace, and you talked about you begin to see your children and your husband differently. So how did that shift right. for you? <clears throat> um, it's kind of hard to explain, but yeah. specifically with my oldest daughter, Lori, mm -hmm. um, we had some friends over one night, and she walked through the room, and I looked at her, and it was like God said, She's yours. I gave her to you. She's your gift. Yeah. And I saw Randy, my husband, in the same way. It was yeah. like we were married. Yeah. Loved him. Didn't like him a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, just yeah. saw saw all of them in a different yeah. light. Absolutely. And then, because you we've talked about Mr. Randy, you know, he knew the truth, but had kind of strayed from his walk with Christ. Right. And he's, I'm, I'm assuming, still on that side of things, you know, kind of taking, living, living on his own um, terms. Did you have a conversation with him about your salvation experience or? I didn't right away. Yeah. I, I think I was kind of afraid to because I thought, okay, I know, I know who I am in Christ now, but. Right. I'm not quite sure about him, so I didn't know how to how to really yeah. um, bring it up. Yeah. I know. I think um, it can be so weird, I think, to go from not talking about spiritual things to talking about spiritual right. things. I mean, that just, it can feel like this is so personal or this is uncomfortable even or what, you know, fill in the blank. But for some reason, I think that can be even more so when it's the people closest to us because mm -hmm. we just have such familiar True. patterns and now we're trying to change them totally, you know? Right. And so I'm sure there was some of that. And I, I hadn't seen him crack his Bible since we'd been right. married. Not that I was looking for it because I, I didn't either, but, right. um, so it was kind of, yeah. do I tell him about this or? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So how did that come about? Um, cause there was another, was there another episode that you listened to? Yes. Um, um it was probably around Easter time okay. and, yeah. um, some people went through like the physical pain that Christ went through mm -hmm. and, you know, I'd heard about Jesus dying on the cross for my sins, you know, right. my whole life. Right. But when that was explained to me, what he went through and how it all played out, I just, I wept mm. and it just, it hurt. Yeah. And um, so I thought, well, I'm going to tell Randy what I heard today. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I told him that I'd heard that, that episode about Christ dying and what he went through. And I said, yeah. it made me cry. And he said, do you know why? And I said, I know why, but do you know why? <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was that was kind of the beginning of our, you know, our Christian 
conversation. And um, I went went to Christian concerts by myself at that time. Mm -hmm. And one day I invited him to come to one. It was, uh, I think it was the band Glad. You probably don't even know that name, but yeah. it's old. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it was at a, a church in part of Omaha, and we went to that concert, and I literally saw him just, mm. he was back, you know, yeah. it, it was like God said, okay, because right. Rand is a musician, yeah. and so the music just touched his heart, and um, things were different, Yeah. so. And that's so neat, the way that he reached you all through two different ways, because you're two different people, you know, right. and like he's a personal God. Right. And uh, that's so cool to me that he reached him through music. Um, so you started to realize, because you are still going to the same church that we talked about, right? Right. Um, right. And you talked about because of that change and both of you kind of realizing where you were and who you are now. Right. You started noticing nobody was carrying their Bibles to right. church. And so what, what did that change look like prompting you into something else well we we started looking for a different church um i mean we there's um one really big southern baptist church yeah. in omaha nebraska it's west side church and so we visited there and filled out an information card and literally the pastor calvin miller was on our doorstep within hours and um i don't think we could talk to him maybe right at that time but he came back yeah and, um, you know, wanted to know about us and our testimony. And um, yeah. we joined joined the church. I love that um, I love that you said that he, came. well, first of all, that he, that he came, you know, mm -hmm. and it wasn't just anyone, but also that he asked your testimonies. Mm -hmm. And that was um, convicting to me because I'm like, when was the last time outside of a podcast that I asked someone, how did you meet Jesus? You know, right. but I mean, how often do we meet a mutual friend and say, oh, well, how do y'all know each other? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we do that in conversation all the time. Right. But we don't ask that simple question. Yeah. You know, it's convicted me. And I'm gonna... <laughs> well, he was, um, he passed away a few years ago, but he was, yeah. I mean, pastor of a, a church probably about the size of North Monroe, where yeah. I go. And um, he, people that we would run into would tell the story of him plopping on their couch. <laughs> Taking his cowboy boots off and putting his feet on the coffee table and just, you know, he, he yeah. connected with people. Yeah. And we so, so appreciated him. Right. So you get involved in that church. And you, um, did you say y'all were there for about 13 years? I think so. For a while. Right. Um, and you y'all got involved in various places. So what did that right. look like? Um, Randy got involved in music ministry. We had a big Awana program. He was involved in that. I think I was involved in that. Um, the church uh, did, and I believe still does, Christmas pageants every year. Yeah. And um, we would do like 13 nights over a couple weeks of wow. Christmas pageants. And I was involved in that drama, mm -hmm. choir, and things like that. Yeah. Um, if Kenneth hears this, he's going to pull you in. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, and so you, and you worked at the weekday preschool, yes. right? Yes. Uh -huh. And during that time, and also serving in children's ministry, when did the call come um, to step into to full-time vocational ministry? Right. Um, there was actually an opening for a children's pastor at that church, yeah. but somebody encouraged Randy to go to seminary. He didn't have... A college degree and so they encouraged him to go to seminary yeah. and uh, we visited a couple different seminaries one was in Kansas City which was close to Omaha mm -hmm. you know a couple hours away right. and then the other one uh, was in New Orleans mm. and so we visited um, when we were in New Orleans we sat we spent the night there toured the campus and um, I remember it was either the mayor or the superintendent of schools coming on, and he said, uh, "He said, yes, we know our system is broken, but it's going to take everybody to fix it." And so we we didn't know quite sure if we wanted to take our 14 year old son at the time yeah. and live in New Orleans, but right. um, but we chose that seminary. It was just 
Yeah. It was clear that yeah. that's where we were supposed to go. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up moving to Baton Rouge, which is like an hour from the seminary. Right. And so Randy took a extension center courses at a church, and then sometimes he would have to drive to New Orleans on campus and go. Yeah. But, but so, we packed up our house, yeah. and 14-year-old left the other three. Um, How was that? Um, it was very difficult. Yeah. And two grandkids at the and time, And two right? grandkids. Yeah. It was very difficult. Yeah. Um, I think after I got to Baton Rouge, I, I probably cried for yeah. two solid weeks. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um, but we um, ended up in a church there that was just, we have lifelong friends there now. So yeah. it's the, they just took us in, took care of us, and yeah, it was good. That's so neat. And then at some point, y'all ended up, because he got a call about a job, correct, while you were there. But it was it at a different church than where y'all were going? Yes. In Baton Rouge. And so y'all were kind of serving at two different churches, right? Well, not really. I okay. mean, we, we, he ended up full-time at gotcha. that, that church. We, okay. The church where we went when we planted in Baton Rouge, we, you know, we served there. It was... Some people thought Randy was on staff because yeah. he was just so Always involved with everything. Yeah. Um, but we took the call and went to a different church and yeah. um, mm -hmm. kind of the same thing. Children's ministry was always, you know, woven, woven, in, woven there. in there. Right. Right. When was it, it was a meeting whenever the CEO of the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home came. Am I jumping ahead? Am I skipping um, anything? I don't I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but at the the first church where Randy was actually employed, yeah, um, we had a women's on mission meeting, yeah. and they would have different speakers come in. Um, the staff at the church would always come in and eat with us, eat lunch, and it was Perry Hancock that came and spoke mm -hmm. about the children's home, and um, I was on one side of the room, Randy was on the other. And he spoke about the children who were at the children's home. Um, and, I mean, I cried. And mm -hmm. I think Randy cried on the other side of the room. But we didn't really talk about it. Yeah. Um, but a few days later, I said, <clears throat> well, there was a need for um, foster parents. Right. I think they called them cottage. We still call them cottage parents, but foster mm -hmm. parents. Yeah. And there was this huge need. Mm -hmm. And I said to Randy, I said, maybe we should call about that position. Yeah. And he said, I already did. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so that was kind of a, a confirmation. Right. <clears throat> and I want to pause here for those listening. What is the difference between just fostering, you know, like just to lay out kind of the, the Louisiana Baptist Home Zone, what's the difference between just fostering, say, in your own home? And right. Then, you know, what, what's the idea and the layout of that? Well, um, all the foster parents at the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home were actually certified by the state. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we could go out on our own if we wanted to and open right. up a foster home. Yeah. Um, what's different about it is is we um, have a total support mm -hmm. at the children's home of the staff and um, social workers. We have social workers on staff there. And yeah. so it's... Um, I'm guessing, right. since I've never been a foster parent on the outside, yeah. I'm guessing that we have a lot more support mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that surrounds us. Yeah, that's neat. I just wanted to <clears throat> throw that out there for anyone that maybe had never heard of it. But um, So you're feeling that conviction. He's feeling that same thing. Already made the call. And then what did it look like? Because you all ended up meeting with them. Right, him right. and his wife. Right, and it was. How did that play I out? don't know how soon it was after that, but we we drove to Monroe. Mm -hmm. um, actually, stayed in one of the cottages yeah. and visited with the parents that were there. Mm -hmm. um, asked a lot of questions, and um, we went out to lunch with Dr. Hancock and his wife Tanya. And we we felt the pull, but we felt that the answer wasn't no, but it just wasn't. Yeah. Right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you feel like it's not now. Then he ends up taking a job at another church as worship pastor. And right. again, involved in children's ministry. Right, right. Um, but then one weekend, and I don't know how much time you can fill in that gap if you want, 
but at some point y'all ended up keeping was it friends kids that went on yes. a yes yes um, <laughs> um was it a marriage retreat marriage retreat a marriage yeah. retreat weekend and um, they needed somebody to keep their kids and they were i think young adolescents maybe young teens gotcha and so <clears throat> we um had them at our house for a couple nights mm -hmm. and you know all of our kids were obviously gone at this time parker was mm -hmm. in monroe yeah and i just sat there and i thought this is great having those kids around our table and just mm -hmm. you know talking to them and laughing and it was just it was a joy mm -hmm. you know so at that point we decided to you know come back and yeah. talk to the children's home actually dr hancock was in um, baton rouge at the associational office wow. interviewing for foster parents and so we went back and talked to him again yeah. i mean i i don't remember what the span is but it was a few yeah. years yeah in between yeah <clears throat> so we answered and here you are here we are yeah, yeah. And you said that y'all had had probably 40 children in y'all's care. I over think the so. Years. I, yeah. I don't really count, but I'm. Yeah, it's some 40, give or take. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit without getting, I know, getting into too many details, just the background and the situations that might put them in mm -hmm. um, foster care there? Well, most of them have been through very traumatic yeah. situations. Um, now, the children's home. Uh, takes children that are in DCFS care, mm -hmm. and they also take children who are private placement. And years ago, the children's home was just private placement cases where mm -hmm. um, maybe mom and dad are in jail, grandma's trying to raise the kids, and she can't do it, so she could place them at yeah. the children's home. We still have a few of those cases, not many, yeah. but most come through the state where they've been removed from their home. Um, mm -hmm. Could be physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, mm -hmm. drugs are involved in majority of the cases, I would say. Yeah. So um, the kids have seen some things yeah. by the time they've been to us, things that we have never seen. Right. So very, just very traumatic, hard, hard yeah. situations. Well, you mentioned while you hadn't walked specific, some of the specific things, but how you can connect with their pain because of some things from your childhood. Right. And so do you want to kind of share with us a little sure. bit about that? Um, when I was probably four, mm -hmm. my parents got a divorce. It was a very, very ugly divorce. Mm -hmm. um, kind of some violent things happened and yeah. a lot of things that I witnessed. Yeah. And then also I was molested as a young girl mm -hmm. into almost adolescence by a family member. And so that was, you know, that's something that I've walked through. And right. so when I, sometimes I just look into the eyes of the kids that we have and, and, you know, I can still feel my pain at times and I can feel yeah. their pain, but I can offer hope to them and say, it's, you know, it's going to be okay. Yeah. And they're safe. I mean, that's yeah. the most, one of the most important things when they're with us is they're safe and they don't have to worry about you know, parenting. A lot of them come to us and they're six, seven, and eight, and they've been parenting their younger siblings. Right. And so we, you know, we tell them, you don't need to do that. We're the parents, we'll take care of it. Wow. So, yeah, you don't even think about that dynamic, you know? Um, and so y'all will take them to school activities. You said even out to eat and vacations. Right. And so just giving them some normalcy. Mm hmm. You know, along with that safety, you yeah. know, all of that, which is so neat. And you mentioned also, Miss Jan, um, something that y'all like to do when you go eat. Is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> something that we started doing years ago, and I don't know how it even started, but when we go out to eat, we'll have a, a you know a server, waiter, waitress come to the table, and we tell them we are, you know, we always pray before we eat. Is there anything that we can pray for for you? Yeah. And we had one guy tell us, no thanks, and turned on his heels. But usually yeah. you get these looks like, are you serious? You yeah. know, and we've had people um, cry wow. immediately. We, had a, um, we were eating out in New Orleans one time, and a lady said, this is the first day that I'm sober, and I want to stay sober. Wow. 
and will you pray for me? And she cried. Um, we had somebody um, say that um, they were in a custody battle with a spouse. Mm -hmm. Pray for me that I can get my kids back and just many different things. Yeah. And it's just amazing how, you know, people are just, they're in need of that, that the spiritual touch. Absolutely. And it's just a, we found that it's just a great way to start conversations with people. And Absolutely. I love that. Well, because so often we can kind of go through like, okay, like I'm heeding the spirit, like I'll do whatever he leads, even if it's unconventional. But to have those patterns that you're like, we're going to make this a pattern for him to work through, you know? Right. And like, it's the same idea as spiritual disciplines. Like, mm -hmm. yes, like I can say, like, I want to hear from the Lord, but if I don't open my Bible, you know? Right. He's going to speak to me through that way, mm -hmm. you know? And so I just loved that practice of having that in place. Yeah. Um, so often we think, Oh, they're not, they're not interested, you right. know, but then just hearing y'all's story, they are, mm -hmm. you know, everyone needs that, mm -hmm. you know, whether they know the Lord or not. Mm -hmm. That's so, so neat. And I wanted you to talk to, um, talk a bit just to the idea of not just loving these children, but the whole families and for your heart, for the family unit. And just kind of share some of that, because sure. I think sometimes there can be this, stigma or maybe judgment you know that isn't always a very compassionate or understanding right. yeah well like i said most of the families that come to us mm -hmm. um drugs are involved mm -hmm. and that's a hard thing mm -hmm. to get out of yeah um some people look at the the parents and say oh they don't love their kids mm -hmm. but i've always had a tug at my heartstrings for these parents that you know they love their kids. You know they want them back. Yeah. But they're so ingrained in that that lifestyle, the drug lifestyle, um, just many other things. Mm -hmm. And they don't have people surrounding them yeah. to help them. Now, granted, they have to want it. Right. You know, that's right. With addiction, you, ha you have to want to be different. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, with our foster care kids, we have what we call family team meetings. Yeah. And I've been to many in person where <clears throat> they'll be the parent and myself and a DCFS worker, supervisor. Mm -hmm. And they have this big whiteboard and they tell the parents, okay, this is, what, you know, what have you done, you know, so far to try to get your kids back? And mm -hmm. these are the things that you need to do. And it's this list that I just look at it. And it seems overwhelming. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, most of them don't have transportation, mm -hmm. um, don't have a lot of money. And so it's just, you know, a difficult situation. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and men, we're raised, <clears throat> they brought themselves up in the same right. way, it's having to raise younger it's siblings. It's generational, yeah. yeah. And it's just very sad. And, you know, here we have the government in, involved. And mm -hmm. really, I think, the church should be the one doing the, yeah. you know, yeah. doing the helping and the healing right. rather than the government. Yeah. So um, it's actually the same couple that we kept their kids for the marriage retreat weekend. They live in yeah. Tyler, Texas now. Oh, I didn't realize that connection. Yeah, and we um, uh, drove through Tyler a few months ago and talked to them. Yeah. And they have a ministry at their church called Families Count. Mm -hmm. And it's where, um, well... The case plans for all the parents that we have, they most of them have to go through a parenting class, yeah. um, substance abuse counseling, and so on. Um, but the Families Count Ministry is um, where couples, parents could come to the church, mm -hmm. get a warm meal, have child care, and take a six-week-long parenting course, which would count, you know, towards the criteria for their DCFS right. case plan. Yeah. And um, so anyway, um, I presented that idea to Wendy Dreger at our church, mm -hmm. and she's like, I want to do this. And yes. so pretty sure it's going to happen sometime in the near future yeah. where we can, we can do that and help, you know, help mm -hmm. the parents. Absolutely. It's, it's so um, it's humbling because when you really start to think of all the things that I had and have in my life. I, I know the Lord. I, 
I've grown up in a, a healthy church, you know, like I have a, a wonderful husband and family members in town. And, you know, I was brought up to know how to do certain things. I mean, I had to learn to change diapers, things like that. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like I, I, it was normal to sit around a table and have a family meal, things I took for granted. And then you take all of those things out and you put my same personality in another scenario. And I don't know, I don't know what choices I would have made or mother I would have been. And it's just, it's so humbling because what we say is a quote unquote, not a good parent or whatever is someone who didn't set out to say, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do a terrible job. I hope I'm not a good, you know, they, they don't know what they don't know. Everyone is out there doing their best. And then you introduce substances and, Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're not making conscious decisions. And so you, it it does begin to change your view of the whole situation. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that is going to be such a neat and necessary ministry. Mm-hmm. How I know it's not started yet, but how can people get involved um, if they're interested? Um, well, being that we haven't started anything yeah. yet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take anything. <laughs> but I know we'll be looking for people to provide meals, yeah. um, to be mentors. Um in the program, the parents can choose whether or not they want to have a mentor. And that doesn't mean, you know, giving the people money because that, that would not yeah. be a good thing. But just coming alongside and being an encourager mm-hmm. to them and, you know, showing them what healthy families look like. And yeah. so, yeah. yeah. That is so neat. Um, and, and age-wise, is there, you know... I mean, is, are you looking for couples necessarily in the mentor? Um, um, probably. Yeah. Um, it, it just depends because right. I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot of single moms mm-hmm. coming to classes. And, right. Um, yeah, it's still just all, yeah. you know, I've, in the works. <laughs> we, get that, we get that life very much. <clears throat> well, um, thank you so much for for sharing that and, and coming and sharing your story and your heart. And it's, it's just really powerful Mm -hmm. and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Mm -hmm. you so much. And thank y'all so much for listening in the SaltWorks podcast. We will see you next week. This is your story